Inwards, outwards. Inwards, outwards. And the word is nonsense. Literally, nonsense. Nonsense is all around us. But what is nonsense to you? Can be no nonsense to someone else. It is very subjective. For instance, I watch news and talk shows on MSNBC, and they appear to be the home of drug commercials. <laughs> Big Pharma seems to introduce new drugs every week. <laughs> and how, I wonder, do they come up with these nonsensical names? The latest one, are you ready, is called so tick to. <laughs> so tick to. What the fuck does that mean? So tick to. S O T Y K T U. So tick to. Now, this is so strange that my automatic spell check can't recognize it as a real word. In fact, every one of the words I'm going to read to you are off the spell chart realm of intelligence. All right? Forget about AI. This stumps AI. Okay. Now, to prove this point that they sound not only nonsensical, but foreign, right? Would, what would you say so tick to is? What language? It's German. German. It's Japanese. Yeah. I mean, Greek and African today. Oh, Greek and African. Good guess. Okay. To prove that these, it sounds like a foreign tongue, I put as many of these uh, drug terms together that I could find. And, and I want to treat you to a session at the United Nations. All right? As one of the ambassadors, using all these words, makes the following speech. Vrela, vrela, sotiktu, miova. Kitruda ingressa, vajero. Sibinko, sibinko. Kulipta nukala, sotiktu. Rubelsas, Rulicity, Pitarvi. Parsika, Arexi, Tupexita. Imbrel, Prelogy. Prelogy. Captiva, Tempesa, Lenity. Ultramirus Rinfolk! Chaptessa was in your breast tree. Tempespire Kiskali Ozempic. O Tesla Kosenket. Arlida Doreva Skyrizzi. Lucerna, I have to stop this because my watch thinks I've fallen and I can't get up. No, it looks like you've taken, no, I'm okay. All right. God, who would have thought? All right. So as I was saying, Erlide Doriva Skyrizi. Lucerna, Umbrelvi, Walter, Eloquis, 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 
Etresto. Salampus. <laughs> Who is a Salampus here? I don't think any of you do. All right. Discovi Calypsa. Capanova. Oxycontin. Oxymoron. Oxy bad news. Okay. So. So. So that's big pharma. I guess it comes from the country Pharmalonia. But um, that's my nonsense. That's my pet peeve. And uh, what I'm going to do right now before I introduce everybody is hand out index cards to every one of you. And I want you to invent a malady and a, invent a drug that will cure it. And at the end of this whole thing, I will read them. All right? For instance, I invented a uh, disease, and by the way, all diseases now have initials. You know that, right? All right. This disease is LLS, which stands for loose lip syndrome. And to take what you do to cure it is you take malonka twice a day, <laughs> and it will cure LLS. All right, so you come up with your own disease or malady and your own cure, all right? And then if any of these make it into the drug world, I, because I'm going to submit them to Big Pharma, we will enjoy the copyright and the money we will share, all of us, okay? So that's my promise to you. All right. Okay. Now, uh, as I said, the prompt is nonsense. And, of course, you don't have to write to the prompt or do anything that uh, promotes the prompt or explains the prompt. Uh, but um, if you do, all well and good. Uh, and if you haven't, that's okay, too. And first up would be, uh, let me see, Amelia Sidlowski. Amelia, step up. And next will be Kitty Kiefer. Yes. What is what is behind me? Is something amazing that Deb once created? Did she? Yeah. This is a Deb copy. Yes. And uh, makes us all feel at home. Hmm. Howdy doody, everyone. <laughs> How are you, kiddo? Oi. Oi. You know, I didn't want to come. I forgot about tonight. I was sitting home, and I'm thinking, ah, I think I'll watch a film. And a friend was coming over. And then I'm thinking, holy shit. I'm going to be here for 7 o'clock. So here I am, kids. Whether you like it or not, I'm here. Yeah. I don't want to miss the IWOW, but, or any of you as well. Oh, that's not as bad as it used to be. You done good. Something happened with the lights that are not eyeball burning. That's good. Um, you know, I think about things as time goes on when I know I'm going to do IWOW. And I think about, hmm, what could I tell, tell anyone about or talk about? Uh, some of you knew Jim and I did antiques and collectibles and traveled all over the lower United States. And we go from Brimfield down to Florida and all around Florida and then out west and up the California coast and coming back. But it wasn't always as easy as that smooth description I just gave. There were a couple of things on Alligator Alley where our water pump went in the middle of it. And um, we traveled in a van. We pulled a 30-foot Dutch craft, which had a bedroom and a bathroom and a shower and a kitchen and a big, big trailer and a dog and us. And so that was one story, which I won't go into now. But the next story is I we were going over the um, 
into California over the mountain. It was called a, all right, so I haven't been thinking about this for a couple of hours, so I can't remember it all, but um, <laughs> it comes and goes. I mean, it really does. But anyway, we're going over the pass. Now, we're this length of a trailer, a 30-footer, and then the van, and in front of us are like, I don't know, forever 18-wheelers, and behind us, forever 18-wheelers, and we're all going over the pass to get into California. And I had never done that before, and we were coming from, I think, Quartzsite, going into California to meet some friends of ours. So anyway, we're driving up, and a storm is coming, and the sky is this black. You know how storms get black skies? This is what was going on. It was just dense. And we're traveling. And there's wind and there's going to be rain. And somehow this heavy wind just took off, grabbed the, the awning from the side of our, our, our trailer, our Dutch craft. So it's like a 20-foot awning. Took it off, threw it up in the air, and down and hit into the trailer, in the roof. And in that wind and in that tumult and in that darkness and with 18-wheelers behind us and those in front of us, Jim had to get up on the roof and batten down that sucker. And it was like a sail on a ship because it was flowing and pulling and, and somehow he did it. I don't know. I didn't watch it. <laughs> you might have known why, but I didn't watch it. It just came down right in the center, and he was able to, like, he had to grab it and wrap it back down and lash it down. I think someone might have helped him a little bit, but this guy is like five, seven, five, eight. Not a big man, not strong, but courageous to get up there and do that. And he lashed it to the side of the trailer as best they could, and then we continued up the hill and up the, over the mount, I mean mountains. Mountains like not, not down to the Berkshires, but we're talking big mountains there. It's called the pass, the something pass. Does anyone know what it is? The what? Um, Donner? Probably, yeah. San Andreas Mountains. Huh? San Andreas Mountains. No, there was another word for it. It'll come to me tomorrow. But <laughs> anyway, um, and we had to travel up, and it was like miles and miles and miles of just schlepping along. I mean, it, it wasn't. There was no romance to it. It was like, will we get up there and get over the mountain and get to the other side? The Great Divide. We're going up the Great Divide. Yeah. So it was like, and there we are, the three of us, my dog Jackson. He was a very brave little dog. Um, yeah, I miss him. Anyway, it was a, a harrowing. We got to the other side, we got to a campground, and then he was able to unfold it and put it back up, you know, properly. I don't know why it let go, but it did. And that he was able to get, and the word courage is right over there, up onto the roof of the sucker and, and wrestle it down, really, until he could, like, tie it to the the trailer again, or tie it, tie it somehow. Um, so it's not so much nonsense, but it's, you know, it's my life. And um, <laughs> can I tell you? <laughs> That's how things are. <laughs> oh, and sudden death. Yeah. Your drugs. <laughs> you know, they tell you whatever, and then... Oh, yeah. And could cause sudden death. 
I don't think you're going to trip me. No, I won't. Look at as a side effect. What? Yes, 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 yes. Oh, yes, side effects. Hi there. I've never sat before, but I guess this makes me do the microphone correctly. Nonsense. Usually the prompt allows me to build a corral, put the prompt in the corral, then I climb in, and my words stay within the fence. I can limit, contain, develop a world with boundaries, the boundaries of the fence, with the prompt, usually. Nonsense offers me no such comfort, no such control. On November 7, 2023, nonsense is everywhere. No boundaries, no forum is safe or unpolluted. There are billionaires, oligarchs, wars where children and bystanders are being murdered without hesitation or remorse, and there is Trump. But first, a disclaimer. I, too, am a politician. Today is election day in my town, and I am in a contested race to become a selectman. The other candidates are incumbent white men. I am as close as my town gets to offering some diversity of point of view and life experience. So, Salisbury, Connecticut. Yeah, nonsense. I can't, nonsense, nonsense. I can't find a universal standard for it. It seems to be a subjective call. Could be a waste of time, could be audience dependent. The speaker can name nonsense, might be manipulative, it might be innocent. When I have used the word, it is strong pushback. That's nonsense, which generally increases the passion and commitment on the other side of the table, whatever's going on. People can believe or buy into nonsense. Examples, Jim Jones saying, drink the Kool-Aid for the common good. Or the 2020 election was stolen. Right after the election, I received a text from a woman I had met at a birthday party for another adult. She was an ER nurse, a wife, a mother. She looked normal. She told me to wait for instructions that would be forthcoming as the election had been stolen from Trump and I blocked her. I blocked her. Um, What she said was nonsense to me. It was not nonsense to her. Even though I understood her words, I saw that her words and beliefs had no structural foundation in my reality, which almost caused me to question my reality. But I could see no other evidence of the election of election fraud or tampering, other than the megaphones repeating and repeating and repeating the election was stolen, which is still nonsense to me, and I am nonsense to them. I don't get anything right, and they can't get it right either. In medieval times, often the court jester was a mentally or physically handicapped person who spoke in nonsense, but had enough command of language to engage an audience. A jester is a jester, wears special clothes, wears some bells, has a wand, usually has a special hat, and may have face paint. We in the court recognize the jester. The jester speaks in riddles and nonsense. Often we laugh. Either the jester does not actually know what is going on in the world of crops, famine, plague, and war, or the jester has been fed information by a superior for the performances to be performed. Jesters in the Middle Ages did not have the World Wide Web. Their information came from certain people, people with authority and power, people who fed them, clothed them, and expected performances. The lines of authority were traditional, visible, and predictable. Currently, we have no predictable lines of authority or truth or even any dependable footnotes. Information bombards us quickly, unpredictably, and for no reason that we can see. We are vulnerable. Facts are becoming more and more like chipmunks, quick, temporary, and often killed crossing the road. (laughs) We now have two courts of authority, two, two theaters with different gestures and different audiences. Nonsense is only fun for jesters, comedians, and script writers. Mm -hmm. 
I deny that the 2020 election was stolen from Trump. My observations of the election process, my trust of the volunteers who staff my polling place, causes me to believe and have faith in our democracy and its processes. I see no evidence to fuel mistrust other than nonsense, absurd behavior. Which brings me back to the court jester, the person with the curled up hat, the bells on a wand, <clears throat> the absurd dancer performing while the queen and king held court in their predictable and glorious finery. Jesters are not predictable. Absurdity is not predictable. Nonsense has only to make no sense. When people believe nonsense, when they believe absurdity, that is not nonsense. That is dangerous and may cause irreparable harm in unpredictable ways. Nonsense is fluid, changeable, non-permanent generally. If you are a jester, you want an audience. Making nonsense or clowning is a skill of the actor who is always watching the audience. Medieval jesters, jesters had a boss, the person who fed, clothed, and paid them. The boss may have given a prompt or a script. The boss might fire the jester, send her back to the fields or to the street. Durability as a jester plays an agenda of nonsense and absurdity to the boss and to the audience. Our current jester has only an audience. His nonsense, his absurdity has no breaks. He spins, spouts, splashes, then speaks. He has garnered more power than I can believe. I suffer. I repeat myself. It is nonsense. It is nonsense. I know it is nonsense. But he continues to have an audience. He has no boss that I can see other than the voters. We are the voters. In New England, we believe that the town the towns follow open meeting laws. We believe that, the pub that public participation is key to town government process. Ten years ago, the Tea Party offered nonsense and absurdity. This absurdity has gone way beyond Sarah Palin. So uh, these are dated July, so I know I haven't been here in a while, but today I feel really good, so here I am. So I have two little poems, and I'm not following the prompt, obviously. So here we go. Hiding in the deep back corner of a winding labyrinth, a giant sea spiral, inside a giant pink nautilus shell from a children's book, the darkness provides comfort, bathed in a saline bath, Cleansed of the world's poisons, my body shouts at me from within. My rib cage keeps the gases and nerve endings trapped. I cannot escape. I give in without wanting to. How did this happen? There is no answer to the why. Whoever said life is fair? Perhaps no one. Hopelessness can overwhelm. I move through the motions of living, regretting nothing but wishing for more chances. My bucket list sits, waiting for each item to be ticked off. As we come and go from this earth, do we tell all our secrets? Even if we journal every day, do those left behind really know us? What fills your thoughts? Much of my time focuses on reaching the next day, but staying in the moment, practicing non-attachment, allowing others their own concerns, worries, anxieties. My focuses rest closer to home, each step upon the earth, felt, enjoyed, noticed, honored. The shapes and sounds of all the unique raindrops, appreciated even when repeatedly filling the saucers under my outdoor plants. So I empty them over and over. Time spent scrubbing the railings of my deck, the shreds of lichen falling to the ground, mixing with the rich soil. I avoid the snails along the stone path. As I move forward, the choice is mine to choose my departure, to sit upon the beach and relax, floating in the water, hiking the steep trails, relaxing with the book. Magically, I keep waking up to a new tomorrow, and I am joyful. So I have one more, and this one is called Falling Away. Like an old macrame necklace dancing in the breeze, each knot another chink along my spine. Energy drips out my body through my left hand. The muscle falls away, 
my breast bones like a rocky landscape. My meds mask the pain and decomposition in my body. I move in a dance, releasing grief from my body, moving through space, each twist and turn telling a story. All those Saturdays spent in my black footless tights, when did we stop wearing leotards? The funny reminder that I did even garden in the nylon fabric without ever so much as a pull or a hole. I'd forgotten about old chores and responsibilities for the lives of others, dependent eyes and little hands always reaching out, clinging, needing, wanting, voicing. So time passes, everything different and yet the same. Looking down on the landscape I call home, freedom in the sky, shadows from the clouds across the treetops, pockets of coolness, uniqueness fades. From afar, everyone appears the same. Differences are erased, but I stand alone, separate, moving at my own unique pace, leaving my mark behind like an old cave painting, no matter how much I try to change. Pastels, pencil, watercolor, my name is written across art without my signature. The blank page sits before me. How to proceed? What will I create next? Hi. You are a first timer. I am a first timer. <laughs> Should I read what I wrote on the yes. card? Oh, no, no. Oh, no, no. Not now. Okay. I'm oh, sorry, I have to read this? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Only pictures. <clears throat> so this was one of the chapters in a book that I wrote, um, still being edited, but um, it was one of the chapters, in, uh, the title of it is The Vegan Hitman and Other Stories from Behind the Juice Bar. <laughs> so this is one of the stories. <clears throat> I was finally out of the intensive care unit. The cloud from the ICU psychosis was beginning to lift. At least when I was no longer laying naked on a mahogany bar except with my hospital gown, while having a surgical procedure being done in my genital area performed by the bartender who was also shucking oysters. <laughs> you do surgery as well as 10 bar, I asked. Sure, he replied. Whatever needs to get done, it's all good. Still a bit hungover from what I was told was a three-day psychotic episode. I could now see my wife, Lucy, and my best friend Gary in the room, engaged in conversation on the left side of my bed. I was in the Miriam Hospital on the east side of Providence, founded by the Jewish community in 1926. So my disorientation and anxiety in light of the events I had just emerged from upon seeing a priest walk in is reasonable. Lucy's response was much stronger, which makes sense from having grown up Catholic. Let me quite qualify that. She grew up Catholic in Munich, Germany. Being Catholic in Germany is very different. In Germany, the church's power was far-reaching. Everyone had to pay a church tax. Imagine paying taxes for a chance at salvation, the greatest church raffle of a lifetime. She also didn't have the luxury of being on the pain-killing cocktail that I was on, so the scene unfolding landed with more weight inside her. Understandable from having watched over the past days as I was dancing on the edge of life and the end of my life. Just two days earlier, my numbers appeared unsurvivable. She was shaken by the sight of a priest entering my room. Here's a suggestion, hospital clergy, priests, rabbis, imams, whatever the faith, dress casual. T-shirts, button-downs, doctors are good, whatever. When someone has just come out from under a coma or a psychosis, just barely making it back, the sight of a priest is not at first comforting. We've all seen too many movies, especially from the 50s, and we know what a priest walking into a hospital room means usually with a heavy Irish lilting broke accent, giving last rites as the families are wailing away, standing, there, standing around their soon departed loved one. I was confused at first, a priest in a Jewish hospital. I was on drugs, what did I know? Maybe he was confused, maybe he was lost. I still had enough morphine and oxycodone dripping into my bloodstream 
and I had certainly spent enough quality time with the abyss. So upon seeing the priest enter my room, I did sales for five years. I get it. He comes over to my bedside, standing across from Ushi and Gary, and I turn my widening eyes left towards them, along with an unsettled smile. Turning back, I see the cliché pose, both of his hands holding his Bible close against his solar plexus. He bends over closer to me and gently asks, would you like to receive communion? I really have a hard time disappointing people. <laughs> it's just not in my blood. For over 40 years, I've been in the hospitality business, making people happy. It's all I've ever known. So, not exactly sure of all the details regarding communion, I responded, sure, I'm Jewish, is that okay? <laughs> With all of our restaurants certified kosher by Rabbi Barry, probably not great for the brand. Oh, he said, pulling away, wishing me a speedy recovery, as he quickly turned towards the doorway, out to the hallway, going door to door. Uh, the narrator is a woman, so I need to say that so you don't mishear everything, because I not, so don't present that way. It's called Bar Stool. Stand by your man has now come on the jukebox. God, this place. Jimmy and I have come here to celebrate mom and election night. She worked the bar here for some years until she died. In the later years, dad used to pop in and try to woo her a second time, but then he got caught up with that Sheila with a big, you know, you know, men. Stand by them, Jesus. Yes, sir, Mr. Jesus, would you please stand by some of these guys? <laughs> then comes on Blue Bayou, Ronstadt's. That's better. I left my baby behind on Blue Bayou. <laughs> Jimmy jokes she left her baby behind on the bayou. I try to divert the conversation with how he turned the adverb behind into a, into a noun, behind. He's not listening. It's the tits coming over to ask about a third pint. To be fair, he ain't hitched like the rest of us. Hey, bro, I say as we get our fresh pints going. You voted today, right? Up to elementary, right? You voted, right? Can't recall exactly. <clears throat> Yeah, I just wondered because look at this little piece on my jacket. I puffed up my kind of tiny chest to show off my sticker. I, I, I voted. I ain't going to look at my sister's breasties. Tell me what it is. I told him. He swigged a big one, wiped it off, thinking. I can tell. He's thinking what to say because he didn't go up there and vote. I know. He comes up with this one. That's a sticker, kiddo, and you got a lamb skin on. Be careful pulling that off. And pull it off tonight or you'll have a cute little dry cleaning bill. I will do as you instruct, Sergeant, sir. Yes, sir. He owns Jimmy's Cleaners. So. Good. That all, he says, and hunches over his beer. We were silent. What was there next? Mom used to say, right in this bar, like in the 80s when the country started going crazy down in Congress and stuff, she, she said, either you vote or you don't, and if you don't, I don't want to hear about it next week. I don't want to hear that fucking radio on. That was her. Pretty good for a nobody. I can miss her, I can, if I try hard. We drank the pints down. He paid. Little sister and all gets that privilege from him. Went to our separate trucks. I can hear his radio on. Even through the windows, it was so loud. Even in this cold Adirondack November air, flakes coming down, and it wasn't music. It was a loud-ass barker telling him how to think. Fucking nonsense. Good man, Jimmy, I whispered. I think maybe you not voting. Mom, right? It's maybe bad enough. 
She didn't answer. She never does. They never do. Any of them. Jesus. Nonsense. <laughs> I have to <clears throat> give my my thing now because unfortunately I have to leave right after I've got an 8 o'clock thing now I didn't write it down but I have musicianosis <laughs> the symptoms are failure to make it to work on time uh, always picking up the guitar and not being able to pay the rent <laughs> the cure Philanthroposis. <laughs> so I, I brought. Yeah, me too. I brought uh, two two songs tonight. Um, one is nonsense, and I wrote it. And the second one is sensical. So in a sense, it's there's some semi sense. <laughs> And uh, the first one is called Progress. I don't want to go to work. <laughs> that, that was from the uh, musicianosis. Uh, also forgetfulness. I don't want to go to school. I don't want to get up. I don't want to grow too old and die, and I don't really want to die young. I don't want to have a purpose. I never wanted to fit in. You know, I took a look around at all the busy, busy people said, I don't want to be like them. Then I thought to myself, I'm up a tree. Never gonna find anybody else to remove the I don't want us from me. I used to think about the Buddha. I used to think about God. I used to think about religion and all the holy people. And then I'd go and sit on the log, cast my net out on the water in the Sea of Galilee. Then I to the Sea of Galilee, throw my net into the boat, call and catch into the boat, feeding the light of heaven in me. I am thankful for the light inside of me. And one thing I can remember is thankful's what I want to be. So the part I forgot of the song was then I'd hum a little note, haul my catch into the boat, and feel a lot of heaven in me. There you go. Now I feel better. <laughs> yeah. So this one is a song by Meg Hutchinson. You may have heard of her. She grew up around here, went to the Waldorf School and then to Simon's Rock and um, in Simon's Rock, she wrote a thesis on musicology and what it was like to uh, write a song and be a folk singer, and and she left her thesis behind at the school, where my cousin, who worked for Simon's Rock, picked it up a year later and held on to it for years and gave it to me just a, a couple of years back, and I... Facebooked her and said, Meg, you know, I've always loved your music. I have your college thesis if you want it. Yeah. She wrote back. She said, 
enjoy it and send it back to me when you want. I'll send you a couple of CDs, what whatnot. And sure enough, I sent it back and I got a couple of, I got a, actually I asked for a couple of her books. Um, but this is a song she wrote called Hard to Change and I'm going out to Wisconsin to um, visit family next week and we're putting on a show at Cafe Carp where she has performed and I asked her in an email, is it okay to, to sing this song? And she said yes. So. So, hard to change. Train whistling home in the dark. Christmas lights up in the trailer park. And across the highway, a good American shot. There is a quiet dignity. Yards tiny and keen, small enough to fall right through the American dream. Here of the billion dollar bailout, neighborhood of the graveyard ship, just a few blocks back from the dealership. And all of these things. Feels so hard to change. You know it used to snow here, but now it only rains. I can barely hear over these machines. Turn them all off. Tell me about your dreams. South from New York City, past Our Lady of Liberty. Toward the strange glow of the factory. I want to hear the silence in my life. But I bought all these tools to save time. But if they say so much, and where's all mine? And all these things feel so hard to change. You know it used to snow here, but now it only rains. I can barely hear you over these machines. Turn them all off. Tell me about your dreams. Want to be your new lover? Want to be your old friend? Don't want to make the same mistakes that our parents did. Feels so hard to change. You know it used to snow here, but now it only rains. I can barely hear you over these machines. Turn them all off. Tell me about your dream. Turn them all off. Tell me about your dreams. Turn them all off. Tell me about your dreams. Thanks. Thanks for the prompt. What I'm going to be reading is some memories and events 
that have shaped me as an artist. Some of it, I believe, is nonsense, but <laughs> what can you do? With a deep love of modern dance, my focus as an artist is and has always been the human body. I work from the inside out, how the body moves through space, how it looks when it is receptive, confronted, traumatized. I see my life as a bundle of forms, built with emotion, bending and morphing according to what I embrace. I am the container that holds it all. My grandmother was cooking chicken. She would take that whole chicken and drop it in the pressure cooker and cook it for a couple of hours until, until the flesh uh, separated from the carcass. I held up a chicken bone and announced to no one in particular, a bone. <laughs> I was five. <laughs> Images of monoliths, mushrooms, rotting leaves and earth, shimmering, suspended in a vaulted, airless space materialized. I knew that I had accessed some deep knowledge of nature and of time. Many years later, I legally changed my name to Bone. Being a curious person, I'm interested in how things work. I like diagrams, manuals, maps, schematics, and systems. I like to poke around in unfamiliar territory to discover something singular and exciting. I examine my findings with a kind of exploratory surgery where I inspect matter by cutting into it, knotting it, twisting, stretching, layering, stacking, and draping it. This gives me a sensory understanding of my subject. I think of myself as an artist with a scalpel. When I was seven, my father had a heart attack. He became obsessed with healing his body. Over the years, assorted medical books filled the house. I studied the pictures and eventually read them all. I loved the diagrams with close-ups close -ups and inserts, figure one, figure two, and could tell anyone who was interested about pellagra, rickets, syphilis, sores, cancers of the mouth, goiters, and, <laughs> and various bodily deformities. I saw the body as a fabulous holder of secrets, infinitely malleable, delicately mutating. To this day, I love medical paraphernalia and surgical procedure. Tongue depressors, bandages, corsets, scalpels, neck and body braces, curatage, making skin flaps, tummy tucks, plastic surgery, removing tumors, exploratory incisions, implants. It's a long list. <laughs> I never intended making the art I make now. It all started when I was about 25. I was relaxing in my living room after a relatively easy day at my job when all of a sudden a torrent of repellent images came pouring out of me. Tubes, tongues, arteries, internal organs, fingers, teeth, severed limbs, breasts, phalluses. I ran to get a pad of paper and recorded it all in drawings made with a black marker on a large tracing pad. I made the drawings in quick succession, gradually refining them over time enlarging the size, using Conti crayon and charcoal instead of a marker, and making them on better paper. These drawings exploded out of me for years, opening a channel that I utilize to this day. I never thought I was making art, rather that I was working something out, and whatever I was working out came from another time and place. In 1987, I traveled all over India 
as a single woman by myself. At that time, India was raw and undeveloped. I spent much of my time visiting Hindu temples, photographing street shrines, and observing religious rituals. India was transformative for me, and I needed to go back again and again to experience the vastness of what I was seeing and feeling. For an artist who loves unconventional materials, India was the mother load of visceral imagery. The landscape of Rajasthan was parched and dusty, smelling of sweat, rotting fruit, and dung. It was hot as hell, the sun a brutal, relentless presence you could not ignore. Women wrapped in brilliant colors walked gracefully amid falling down buildings and bustling markets. Intricately carved temples housed, housed blackened altars with sensuously carved deities, both ferocious and erotic. Everything was coated with an ancient grime of incense, smoke, and butter. And for me, it represented a portal to a primal past. I lived in Jaipur for a few months in 2003 while looking for a workshop to block print a line of textiles I had designed for my company, Sleeping Buddha. It was the first of many trips. I loved to watch the cotton fabric being submerged in huge black cauldrons balanced over wood-burning fires, and the laborious work of hand-printing the fabric from carved wooden blocks. I loved those death-defying trips to the workshop, my auto rickshaw sharing the crowded roadway with camels, cows, ox carts, chickens, and motorcycles. Most of all, I loved the alchemy happening in the shadowy recess of the workshop, where amid the garbage, grit was turned to gold. Well, good to see you. Is this about right? Okay. I'm not used to sitting. Ah. Nonsense. We'll see where it shows up in my life. My father was a worldly 29-year-old when he met my 18-year-old mother. She was an innocent, vivacious, sheltered college student. He had finished his World War II military service. She was a talented pianist, a freshman at the Eastman School of Music there on a scholarship. It must have been really exciting because within a year they eloped and my mother's college and music career was out the window in favor of having a family. Many years later, I unearthed some old photos of my dad from the army. He was tanned and muscular, surrounded by women in these photos when he and his buddies were on leave. I asked him, what happened to all those women? He said, I knew I wanted to marry someone passive, agreeable, easy to get along with. Apparently the women he had met had too much to say. He was domineering. My mom was sweet, passive. He liked that. And we all lived with the consequences. It was always clear who was in charge in our household and who really wore the pants. Big, hairy, scary daddy. We were a large family, four girls and one boy. When dad was away working, life was fun and easy. When mom was there, it was easy. She was never yelled. She was a little disorganized, chaotic. How she dealt with five kids in seven years with no help, I really don't know. But generally, it was a fun and functioning household. Every now and then, however, 
Vesuvius would erupt. That was my father. While normally a warm, funny, smart man and a great dad, sometimes he wasn't. Something would set him off. The wrong word said, a fresh remark from a kid, the wrong dish offered at dinner, and he would erupt in a sudden explosion of anger. He'd throw dishes, he'd smack us, and one time he hurled the whole dining room table over. We ran and hid from him, and so did my mom. She cowered with us, hiding where he couldn't reach us. We loved him, and we hated him. Things took a little sudden turn when my mother turned 45, though. She was rushed to the hospital for an emergency hysterectomy. I was at summer camp. My father called to let us know mom was okay. He never told us exactly what had happened. But this young woman, 45, had her ovaries and all her female parts taken. How much of a shock that was to her, we didn't know yet. No one talked about it very much. I believe my mother was a superwoman because she never complained. But it is sheer nonsense to take a 45-year-old woman's ovaries and not expect some side effects. Perhaps an emotional roller coaster. Sadly, within a year, her beloved father also died, suddenly during a surgery to remove a cancer that, as usual, no one had told us about. And that's when my mom fell to pieces. Her self-confidence and strength, whatever it was, drained right out of her. The very fabric of her being unraveled and she sank into a deep depression. Another thing none of us had ever heard of in 1970. My mother's grief sent her, sent her already shaky chemistry down so badly that she went to bed and wouldn't get up. Even though her beloved children came in and said, please get up, we love you, nothing could reach her. She didn't believe in herself. I remember my father yelling at her to get out of bed. He said, it makes no sense. You have everything to live for. This is nonsense. Nonsense? He had never been depressed a day in his life. His job was to make other people depressed. How could he understand? The doctors suggested shock treatments. It was the only tool they had, and it worked. My mother emerged from a few days in the hospital not remembering her depression. She forgot a lot of other things, too, but it was worth it to have my mother back. It seems that shock treatments just kind of wiped the slate clean. She was back to my agreeable, passive mom. You know what was nonsense, though? taking the ovaries of a 45-year-old woman without telling her she might need hormone replacement. You know what else was nonsense? My father not understanding her emotional turmoil. And you know what else? When you don't understand someone else's experience and you call it nonsense. These days, we're prone to do that. We call each other's beliefs nonsense. Each side can't see the other's point of view. It's almost an epidemic. What was so real for my mom made no sense to my strong, domineering father. Interesting what happened 18 years later. My mom died of a sudden heart attack. My father was as shocked as all of us. Saddened too, but it also seems he was deeply guilty. He had been yelling at her when she had the fatal heart attack. Within a few months of her passing, we noticed something was wrong with him. He was not answering the phone. He was not going out. In fact, as he embarrassingly told us, he was depressed and he wouldn't get out of bed. My sister had to fly to Florida to take him to the hospital for, can you imagine? 
Shock treatments. He went to the very place that my mother had gone so often to bring her back to her senses. Was it a hard decision for us, for us to take him there, even when he didn't want to go? Nonsense. In fact, in the end, it made perfect sense. He finally understood. We all understood. And the treatments worked. Good evening, I wow. Good evening. I am woefully non prepared, which is not nonsense because preparation helps us, it, it does some things. But so I am sans preparation. Without preparation, it all started this morning when I went to put on my pants and I said, are those pajamas or are those pants? And I thought about it and I said, what's really the difference? I mean, it doesn't matter. You know, there was whole times on Zoom where who could tell if I was even wearing pants, right? So I just kind of let that go and said, we'll see how it goes. I'll see how the day goes. But it's not nonsense to wear colorful things that make you smile, that set you apart, that are very lightweight and hide a multitude of sin. It's one of my favorite words that is nonsense. Now, I looked up nonsense because, you know, when I don't know what to do or I'm unsure or I wasn't prepared, I looked up nonsense and, you know, what did it say? Lacking in sense. I had lacking in sense. So I think sans. Sans prepared, sans air conditioning, sans tomato. I love that word sans. It's literary. It's intelligent. It makes me look like I know something. So I start thinking sans sense. Nonsense is sans sense. And I'm like, now why did sans sense never pick up? It sounds like nonsense. It's almost one of those words, onomatopoeia. That's why well, I actually said that well. Onomatopoeia, twice. That, um, that don't make sense. We don't know where they are. So I looked up sans. And sans is a proposition, a preposition, versus non, which you cannot look up no or non. They're the same thing. It keeps on coming no or none and not N-U-N with the habit, N-O-N-E or none. But those are nouns. So nonsense is a noun modifier and sans is a proposition. Preposition. A pre data. A prep the Google. A preposition is a word placed before a noun or pronoun to form a phrase modifying another word in the sentence. Therefore, a preposition is always part of a prepositional phrase. The prepositional phrase almost always functions as an adjective or an adverb. And I thought, that is nonsense. That is circular, and that definitely does not make sense to me. So I started thinking about what makes sense to me, and I looked up the opposite. And the opposite of nonsense is clarity, judgment. I have a lot of words here on my medical card. Clarity, judgment, prepper, uh, no, that was what I did. Clarity, judgment, common sense, fact. And I started thinking about my grandmother. Somebody talked about the chicken in the pot. Who talked about that? The chicken bone. Chicken in the pot. My grandmother, you know, she would always say in Yiddish, oh, that one has no sakel, no sakel, no common sense. And throughout my career, I always said, you cannot, we dealt with a lot of policy, a lot of change laws, and I would always say, you cannot legislate common sense, right? You can't make it, this has to be thoughtful. This has to be, make sense. You cannot legislate common sense. Hence, we live in a world sans sense. So where am I going with this? I do not know, because I am sans preparation in navy pajamas without bottoms. But what I am going to say is that I showed up. Yeah. I made you laugh, and that is non-nonsense. Thank you. <laughs> okay. What makes a life? For 32 years, I was a teacher and a teacher trainer in the field of English as a second language. Before that, I worked in a settlement house with free delinquent teens. And before that, I was an investigator for the welfare department in New York City. What in my childhood led me on this path? 
Was it purely serendipity or was it something else? I was the child of immigrants and my earliest childhood was filled with poor people of every ethnic background. My mother was born in Belarus, Russia in 1910. She was the sixth of eight children and came to the United States in 1921 as an orphan. My father, who was born in Poland, close to the German border, moved with his family to Magdeburg, Germany when he was 13. His family moved to the USA in the 1920s, but my father chose to remain in Germany where he took part in the cabaret society of the Weimar Republic. In 1931, he came to the USA on a visitor's visa. Because he had a warrant out for his out for his arrest after getting into a fight with some Nazi youth, he remained here illegally throughout the war. A friend of my parents introduced my father and mother, and they married in 1935. Although my father eventually became an American citizen, I think my mother never forgave him for not telling her of his immigrant status when they married. I also think she never forgave him for not making a good living. The earliest childhood memory I have is of eating candy in my father's luncheonette in East New York, Brooklyn, having eczema, scratching my legs, and my mother wrapping them with bandages. After losing his luncheonette, our family moved to the Kingsboro Housing Project projects in Brownsville, Brooklyn. I was six years old, and it was 1946, shortly after the Second World War. Brownsville at that time was made up of primarily Russian Jewish immigrants, but the Kingsboro Projects was a melting pot of families of different races and religions. We lived in one of four six-story buildings built around the courtyard. There were 16 such buildings that spanned between Ralph Avenue in Brownsville and Rochester Avenue in Crown Heights. My address did not have a street name. It was 719 Kings, Seventh walk, seventh walk, and it signified that we lived on the seventh block. I was embarrassed by this address because it meant that we lived in the projects, and the projects were meant for poor people. We were indeed the poorest relatives on both sides of our family. Our relatives did not like coming to visit us because the people in the projects were very different from the ones they were accustomed to in their Jewish neighborhoods. Instead of Jewish chicken soup, the hallways of our building, building were filled with the unfamiliar smells of collard greens, rice and beans, and corned beef and cabbage. Our apartment was on the second floor and was bigger than the one we had over the luncheonette. We had a lot of neighbors. The Ratnas, who were Jewish, lived directly below us, and the Malvikas, who were Italian, lived above us. There were the Greek Manzaruses and the Irish Hagans, the Sanchezes, who were Puerto Rican, lived across the hall, and the Jacksons, a black family, live next door. We were friends with all of these families, but we were closest to the Ratners, who brought culture into our lives and were the only other Jewish family in the building. It was from listening to Paul Robeson sing, Give Me a Little Water, Sylvie, Girl Ives sing, When Froggy Went to Corton, and Woody Guthrie, Sing, singing, this land is your land, in the Ratner's apartment, 
that I developed my love for folk music. The music that I heard there was new and different from the music I heard on the radio. Lou Ratner was a photography buff and took pictures and movies of his family as well as ours. And Ethel Ratner was a classically trained musician who played Bach or Chopin on her baby grand piano. Their three children were our friends and my mother was friends with Ethel, who she admired. And it goes on and on and on and on, but I'll stop here. <laughs> well, just about all I do is nonsense, right? Oh, oh, no. oh yes. Oh, yes. Look, at see, I can't even get this strap thing done. Do I need it? So I was going to read like four lines, but I'll, do, I'll read it anyway, because if I don't read this, then I won't feel right when I go home, right? So my cat at home, her name is Lucy Lou. No, little Lulu, Lucy Lou. So this is what I wrote. It's not there. <laughs> so, let's see. Here comes Lucy Lou, crying all like heck. She's got a baby rabbit in her mouth by the neck. I set it free, it seems fine, but well, watch out for Lucy Lou, because it's always dinner time. <laughs> now that... Did you set that for your sister? Maybe I will. I forgot my... I don't have my pick. I don't have my pick, but I guess I don't need it. So, uh... So, most of us here remember back in the day when no cars had... Or trucks had bucket seats, just a sports car, right? So when you had a sport, when you had a a bench seat, you could get your girlfriend over next to you. So you, while you're riding around, right? This this song is called uh, "Driving with One Hand." Makes some sense, right? All right. So driving with one hand. Let's take the back road home and I'll drive with one hand. I'll hold you close as we go rolling on. Let's take the back road home and I'll drive with one hand. Oh, Nellie, girl, you're my heart's desire. Well, we've been traveling these back roads since we were 17. The road's the same, but we have changed, I guess. So Nellie, snuggle up to me and I'll cuddle up to you. Travel the back roads, nothing better to do. Well, your mother used to say to you, Nellie, don't be no one's fool. Don't travel those back roads with those crazy boys. You know all they want to do is cuddle up to you. Travel the back roads, nothing better to do. Let's take the back road home and I'll drive with one hand. I'll hold you close as we go rolling on. Let's take the back road home and I'll drive with one hand. Oh, Nellie, girl, you're my heart's desire. Well, we finally made it back to our place outside of town. Nellie, there you got quite a smile on your face. Put your wedding dress on one more time. I'll turn that radio down low. We'll laugh and dance like we did in our wedding day. Let's take the back road home and I'll drive with one hand. I'll hold you close as we go rolling on. Let's take the back road home and I'll drive with one hand. Oh, Nelly, girl, you're my heart's desire. <laughs> All right, so...
Well, thank you very much. I guess I could do another song. Well, it's an easy song, but I've been trying to memorize it on the piano. And it's so simple that, but it's even hard for me. But I can play it on the guitar a little bit. You can sing if you want. I see. Wish I had my pick. Well, it's all right. Let's see. You'll know this. Crazy, crazy for feeling so lonely. Here we are. I'm crazy, crazy for feeling so blue. I knew. Love me as long as you want it. And that someday you leave me for somebody new. La, la, la. Worry, why do I let myself? Worry, wondering what in the world did I do? Did I do? Oh, I'm crazy for thinking that my love would hold you. And I'm crazy for crying, and crazy for trying, and I'm crazy for loving you. <laughs> All right, well, thank you. <laughs>